Cool. All right. Yeah, well, um, and and hello, everybody, and, and thank you very much for having me along. I hope you're all coping all right in these strange times. Um, well, yes. So in terms of it being up and running, I'm, I'm afraid to say that the, um, the plan is, well, so the good news is it's now legally able to be made up and running because we've resolved um, four of our five environment court um, challenges. So uh, the only remaining one is about marine pests and that's separable from the plan um, and we hope to have that resolved in the middle of this year but we can we can make the plan as it stands at the moment operative um, in terms of the court process stuff. Um, unfortunately though as soon as we got ourselves into that position we've been scuppered by the whole COVID-19 thing and so uh, we're just on pause because of that now. Um, but I, I do hope that, um, that we will have an operative plan really, really soon. Um, and, and I guess as we move down those alert levels, that becomes more promising every day. So so stand by for a formal, um, formal notice that, that we've got an operative plan. Um, and so then I, I guess I, my understanding of my brief today is just to, to talk you through quickly what the plan will mean for Waitakere, um, and particularly what's changed in the environment court process. So I've assumed um, that the vast majority of you, if not all of you already have heard me talk on at least one occasion um, about the um, Regional Pest Management Plan and you know what it is. Um, so apologies to those of you who maybe um, aren't in that position. Um, so I won't go into a lot of detail about the plan overall, but I will just do my usual plug for the fact that it is really exciting. Um, it, as you say, it's been a long process. So I think we started back in 2014 or 15. And so it, it does feel really exciting to have the plan on the brink of becoming operative. It is, um, at, thanks to the natural environment targeted rate, it is a huge increase over the plan that we've been previously operating under. So 189% increase in investment and over 400 pest programs. So mm -hmm. that's pretty yes. cool. So in terms of what's changed through the yeah, environment court process, we well, so one of the things that we had heard, in fact, through the um, through the submissions process as well, and we made some attempt to sort of uh, change the wording of the plan, but obviously maybe not enough, um, was that the, um, the the parts of the plan that that relate to the Waitakere ranges are quite distributed through the plan, and it's, it wasn't really that easy to sort of pick the plan up and see all in one place what does this mean for the Waitakere ranges. So one of the things that we've done through this environment court process is add um, a bit more signposting on various parts of the plan so that you can see more clearly what is this that applies to the Waitakere ranges. There is, we will see that there's a new section of text in the plan which really has just got a little bit of a summary of the various different elements of the plan that are quite specific to the Waitakere ranges. And, and I should say that the plan has always recognised that the Waitakere Ranges are um, one of our amazing, large, um, incredibly valuable um, parts of the region that is a real, real priority. So the, the fact that they were distributed through the program, through the plan was a was a surface features thing, but it certainly wasn't any um, uh, sense that, that they weren't important within the plan. So the other um, part of that that you'll see um, in this table, as an example, is that there is a new column that we've added into this table, which is a summary table of all the different um, plans. And so you see in that bottom row down there, Agapanthus has got a tick for the Waitakere Ranges. And so that helps you see that, that there's a, a program there that is, um, has got something that's specific to the Waitakere Ranges in it. What I will say, say though, is that when you look at uh, tables like this, and you see these other species that aren't ticked for the Waitakere Ranges, but it's really um, really important to remember that a lot of our regional programs, although they haven't made it into having a tick for the Waitakere Ranges specifically, they do benefit the Waitakere Ranges um, by having that regional uh, sort of perspective. <coughs> and I can't do a talk about the Regional Pest Management Plan without putting in this graph. And I know that lots of you will have seen it before, but it is, I think, so much more resonant to us all just at the moment with this whole COVID thing. And so I guess this is by way of comparison to, to the COVID-19 situation. So this is a graph of how, how a new pest, whether it's um, climbing asparagus or whether it's COVID-19, over time 
it's going to go through this, not, there's not very much to start with, and then you get this explosive exponential growth curve until it's pretty much everywhere that it can be. And if we think about New Zealand's response to COVID-19, we had this opportunity to go hard and go early uh, because we started when there was very little there. Whereas you see the UK, for example, is already sort of well up this um, exponential growth curve and and so the situation that they're dealing with is very different and I think this is a really um, a really important thing to always be aware of in, in the pest management um, process so uh, a lot of the things that you'll see ticked in the Waitakere Ranges columns will be these things that are already well established and they're up there in that asset, asset protection kind of space and, and there's something on the ground that's happening in the Waitakere Ranges but there are also things that are happening at a regional level they're really, really important to protect the Waitakere Ranges for, from future pests. Um, and so let's not forget them as well. And so these things really haven't changed through the environment court process, but I just think they're the sort of thing that often gets overlooked because we don't see them, because they're the things that aren't, haven't made their way through that conveyor belt of pests so much yet, and I always like to do a plug for them. So one of the, the things that's really important in the RPMP is that it does um, regulate trade so there are 54 new uh, species of plants and 11 species of animals that you can currently walk into um, a garden centre or a pet shop and purchase and we know that these are things which will be um, the new climbing asparagus, the new moth plant, the new ginger because um, if we keep planting them in our gardens um, or having them as pets that escape then uh, they'll get out into the wild and so um, so they'll, they will be phased out. At the moment it still says by 2022, but we're aware that with the delays that we've had to implementing the plan, it may well be that we need to push that out a bit further. Um, there are also over 30 pest plant species that we are targeting for eradication across the whole region. And that's really important too, because they're ones that hopefully you will never have to be weeding out of the Waitakere Ranges. So that's the regional stuff that it's good not to forget, but uh, there are some things which are more um, directly on the ground happening in the Waitakere Ranges. And so one of the most important ones really for, for your, um, your terrible scourges such as the climbing asparagus and the ginger is this um, pest management on and around parkland program that we've got. So we've seen through the targeted rate already, um, we've been able to substantially increase the amount of investment that we're putting into controlling uh, pest plants on parkland. And then um, once the regional pest management plan does become operative, it will bring in these rules that are in these buffers around high value parkland. So we're really looking to take a more targeted enforcement approach um, to the places that matter rather than sort of randomly scattering it over the region, which is sort of what happens under the legacy strategy. Um, and it's got a few other really cool features like being able to bind the crown for the first time and that sort of thing. So you've probably heard about that program before but there are some aspects of it that have changed through the environment court process. I should say the budget hasn't changed so um, we're still going to have to make that get around all the things that we want to do but uh, we do have a bit of flexibility to do uh, um, some extra things that we didn't have under the original plan. So first of all, when we're working in those buffers, we've got a wider range of plant species that we can um, that we can enforce on private land buffering those parks. So um, there are five species that can be enforced anywhere in the buffers, although we uh, will probably mainly, they're vegetative things that just sort of creep over the, the fence most often. And so uh, we've been particularly concerned about properties that are immediately contiguous to the parkland. So that's Blue Morning Glory, English Ivy, uh, Giant Reed or Arundo, um, Japanese Honeysuckle and Periwinkle. And then, so those apply to all the, the buffers uh, around parkland throughout the region. And then there are a couple of species that are just specifically for um, roads that run through the regional parkland in the Waitakere Ranges. And so that's Gorse and Pampa. Um, and we've also uh, slightly extended 
the um, the parts of the Waitakere Ranges that have got that, those buffer walls applying to them. So on this map you can see the green areas are the parkland, the orange stripy areas are the buffers that already um, existed in the plan that Council adopted last year, and then the grey stripy areas are the extra um, buffer that was added in through the environment court process. So all those orange or grey areas will be um, where we're able to make sure that um, private property owners or, or Crown land, um, that those um, land areas are being managed for these weeds in order to, um, to protect that parkland from being reinvaded. So what else? Um, so also um, focusing on our important uh, parkland areas such as the Waitakere Ranges, we had um, substantial step up in pest mammal control, so a whole range of uh, mammals from um, possums and rats, pigs, um, keeping deer and goats out of the Waitakere Ranges. So that was already contained um, in the Regional Pest Management Plan, uh, but again we've just sort of amplified that a little bit more through that environment court process. Um, so for possums in particular, the plan now says that we'll aim to get possums below 2% RTC in the Waitakere Ranges instead of below 5%, so that's just a little bit more intensive possum control in that area that was already going to receive possum control anyway. Um, and, and also more explicitly highlighting the priority of, um, of the Waitakere Ranges for some of those other species. So like trying to, um, to get as close to zero density as possible for feral pigs. Um, and of course we were already planning to keep deer out of the Waitakere Ranges. And both of those are important not only for their own immediate impacts on biodiversity, but also because they can spread cardiac disease even further. Um, and I think that's pretty much about it. Uh, of course, it's a huge plan, and so I've, I've done my best to cram what I can into a, a short presentation, but I'm really happy to take questions on, on those bits or anything else that you've got questions on. So, um, Melvin, um we, we've actually got lots of questions. I'm sure you do. Um, but but um, my first question is, um, are we able to get a copy of, of um, what you're presenting? Like when, when will that be made available, the changes? Uh, yep, so that's a good question. Um, the actual, a, a proper glossy, fully formatted new regional pest management plan will be available on our website soon. We're just in the final stages of kind of making it look nice. Um, and I am wondering whether the I think that the changes that we agreed to in the Environment Court, so the things I've just talked you through, I think are already on our website. Um, I'm just outing myself for a minute, so I can actually check that and follow up with you. But I, I feel that they're already there. Great. Um, look, I'll just start running through some of the questions. Um, so I've got a question here. Has the funding for the Regional Pest Management Plan been affected by the budget cuts currently happening at Auckland Council as a result of COVID-19? Uh, not at the moment, no. So we've, we have, uh, so far Council has um, terminated a number of contingent worker uh, positions and so we have been affected in terms of our, some of some of our project management in particular and, and a few other activities where we didn't have staff members, we had contractors acting as contingent workers, we've lost those people. We haven't lost the budget, but we've lost that capability because we didn't have it in-house. Um, I don't know how long that situation will go on for. At the moment, in terms of actual budget, it's certainly very clear that Council's uh, financial position as a result of COVID is extremely constrained, um, but it, so far we've had nothing to say that our budgets will be cut. Um, I think we can't assume that, that they are necessarily safe, but at the moment um, I haven't heard anything on that. Um, and we've also got someone, someone has said, um, can I confirm that NETA is fully ring-fenced and cannot be siphoned off due to Council's general drop in revenue? Um, 
and certainly, uh, yeah, we're, we're really keen. And I, I believe Greg also wanted to talk to that. But if you could just answer that question, it would be great. Yeah. Um, so Neta, as a, as a targeted rate, it is ring fenced to uh, the activity that it's to be, um, that it was raised for. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, it can't then be siphoned off to be used for something else. Um, I don't think it's guaranteed that we retain that through the um, upcoming review of the long-term plan. So, you know, these are, it's a 10-year budget plan, but it gets reviewed every three years in practice. So um, it is open to council to change its mind about how much it uh, wants to gather in NETA. So obviously encourage you all to continue to um, to, to convey to your elected members how important it is to you for us to be having that money. Um, but, but yeah, uh, the money that we've got at the moment, uh, as far as I know, it can't be transferred to something else. Thank you. Greg, would you like to add to that? Sure. Uh, I had the uh, chance to ask that uh, question at a meeting last week of councillors and local board chairs and the response was generally the same. Uh, it's a ring, fen a ring fenced fund, which shouldn't be used for any purpose apart from the reason it was collected. Uh, but uh, which it's right that we do live in interesting times, but uh, I think we just need to be uh, very vigilant about it and make sure that it is spent for the purpose that it was gathered. <clears throat> Right. Um, thanks, Greg. Look, um, Megan, I noticed you mentioned um, uh, something about uh, volunteers being able to resume trap lines under level two. I'm not sure if that's um, Imogen's uh, department, really. Um, I think that Parks will need to answer that question. Um, but believe me, we are asking that. Um, so if I hear anything, I'll let you know. Um, now, Stuart has asked, um, Imogen, how will the buffer rules be enforced? Mm, good question. Um, so I think the, the critical thing from my um, from my point of view about enforcing the buffer rules is that I'd like to see them enforced really systematically. So um, the situation that we've had with our legacy pest plant um, rules is that we have a very reactive kind of enforcement process. So. Um, I could ring up council and say my neighbour's got woolly nightshade and council will come out and enforce that woolly nightshade rule but then there's a bunch of other pest plants potentially on their property that don't get removed uh, but also somebody three doors down the street might have woolly nightshade too and nothing's done about that and so you sort of got this constant cycle of reinfestation and so what I'd like to see um, with enforcing the buffer rules is that we are um, much more systematic and pick up places and do one place well um, so that we actually get an ecological outcome from that which is protecting that local parkland from all of those weeds uh, rather than sort of randomly scattergun um, reactive enforcement so we're looking to see um, systematic survey work community engagement getting um, the whole community behind this and using our um, enforcement powers to really sort of plug the gaps within that so I see it as working really in tandem with the kind of um, community action that, for instance, your groups are, are really involved with. Does that make sense? It does. So um, my question, really, sorry, is I, I live in Waima, in Titirangi, and mm. so does that mean, uh, and I'm surrounded by climbing asparagus, mm -hmm. um, and this runs in tandem with the question that Anna Lily is asking, um, so how do we notify council of buffer zone weeds and mm. uh, uh, what kind of support will I get in Weimar? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think I think this is going to be a challenge for us. We know that um, we don't really, despite having a big increase in budget, um, we certainly don't have the budget to do all the buffers well soon. So it is going to be a process of phasing in buffers. We won't be getting to all of them um, this year or next year. Um, and so what we'd be looking to do is um, to have online available, um, when you look at our GeoMaps layer, you'll be able to see where all the rules apply, but also specifically where are we activating that enforcement power at the moment. Um, and I think we'll be looking, when we activate a particular area of buffer, we'll be looking to reach out 
to groups like yourself. So hopefully you'll be really, really aware of our activity in that space. Um, and then we'll have a number of pathways by which you'll, you'll be able to report that either into um, local staff who you've got relationships with or through our um, generic email address, that sort of thing. Um, and, and so probably I'm not intimately involved in the operational design of that process that's happening at the moment, um, but that in a sort of a high level generic level, that's what we're planning on doing. Does that make sense? Um, it does. Um, I just had one question around that though. In the previous pest management plan, moth plant was an absolute no-no in the Waipakere Ranges. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we have moved to that change of kind of like a rolling front and um, cert only in certain areas, are you still going to build a moth plant which is just up the road from me? Mm. Yeah, that is an excellent question. And, and I think, yes, look, coming back to that pest infestation curve thing, absolutely those things that are less present um, that we know that we don't want uh, want them to get away on us, then yes, I, we would be looking to, um, to enforce those sooner rather than later. So yeah, if there are those things like moss plant that you see creeping in around the edges, absolutely um, let our staff know and, and we, so we do, have the ability to enforce those rules more generally. Um, for the things that are already widespread, as, as I said, we'd like to do it in a really systematic way, but if it's that um, getting rid of the early invaders aspect of it, then yeah, the, the rules are there for us to enforce. Um, the only constraint on our enforcement is that the, um, the parkland that you're protecting needs to be under control for that pest species, but if it's something that's low incidence and just moving into the area, then that will be the case already, so that's not a problem. Um, so I'm, I'm just looking through some of the questions that relate to that. Um, so when doing buffers, will you do all pest plants present or just some? We will do uh, the ones that we think are really ecologically important for, for that site that we're trying to protect. So there's a range of plants in that buffer list and some of them will be less relevant for some ecosystems. And so, um, a good example of that is something like coast banksia, which maybe um, is particularly important if, if you're talking about a coastal area, but um, if, if your uh, local area is dense bush, then maybe it's not an issue. And so um, if somebody's got a, a lovely big coast banksia tree that the two are coming in and um, feeding on, then, then uh, and they're not in a coastal area, then maybe um, we wouldn't be enforcing that. But by and large, most of them will be, yeah, will be coming through and enforcing them collectively. Sorry, it's just some random noise behind me. I don't know what it is. Some member of my family sounds like they're doing construction work in their lounge. Um, look, I'm, there's quite a few questions here. I'm just going to read through some of them. Uh, there's also a statement here from Megan that she did report Woolly Nightshade with a photo via the council online form and uh, was sure to mention the RPMP. Um, and so that's been quite successful. So good for everyone to note. Yep. Um, Steve, uh, Pam question, Pam's question is not about the plan. The question is, how does council get informed? Um, I think that's more about process of, um, you know, what, what what's our communication and, and mm. correct me if I'm wrong here, Stephen. Um, and I think that that was what Anna Lily was asking as well. How, you know, like, hey, how are you informing us that this is a target area? Or how do we even know that moth plant, mm. I, I can report it? Uh, where's the, the communication? Yeah, yeah. So it's a two way thing. So I know what the process is. Yeah. And I will, um, I'll pass that question on to Sarah, who's um, designing our buffer program at the moment, because I think that's really important for her to hear uh, that, to, to understand where your thinking is and how we can best then tailor our communication to, ma to make that um, easier and more apparent for you. Cool. Well, I've got a question here. What about a case where a resident is on the no spray list, but has significant weeds on Auckland transport land, um, from their house, how would something like that be managed? Mm, that's a good question. So um, the Regional Pest Management Plan doesn't prescribe how the weed control needs to be done. So it doesn't say you have to use um, chemicals. It just says this is the outcome that you need to achieve. Uh, so I think there's a process that could be worked through there in terms of um, 
negotiating how that might be done. Um, I think it, it is more challenging those nose bro registers in um, the sorts of places that you're talking about. If you've got large swathes of climbing asparagus, which we know is very difficult to control without um, that herbicide. So uh, I think that's a conversation that, that Auckland Transport or that is community facilities on their behalf would need to be having with that land occupier. But ultimately, the regional pest management plan can require that that work is done in some way. Um, now we've got some questions here around um, animals. Um, so Robert was asking about goats. Um, will that be beefed up in the Waipakere's, uh, including using legal means if necessary? Um, so yes, um, so what the plan has brought in is, well we've said we really want to exclude um, feral goats from the Waitakere ranges and we've also introduced a, a sort of a buffer goat, um, goat farming rules and a buffer around the Waitakere ranges. So that means it will make it much clearer that if your goat is not um, properly fenced and identifiable on your property, um, then it is a feral goat and so uh, it is possible for us to enforce that. I'm glad that makes you happy Robert. <laughs> makes us all happy. Um, look there is a, a bit of conversation down the side about um, feral cats, why aren't they included? Feral cats are included so I saw, I've lost it out of the, um, it's somewhere further up my feed now but I did see um, Robert suggesting that we'd used a euphemism of unknown cats for feral cats. So it's it's not so much a euphemism as a higher level of classification. So the unknown cat category is designed to um, to encompass feral cats and stray cats. So our old strategy was only about feral cats and they are really um, cats that are well removed from human civilization. Their populations are really independent of humans and domestic cats. And we know that Auckland is just so urbanised that even in the Waitakere Ranges, now many of the cats that are threatening uh, your native wildlife will actually be stray rather than feral. And so we wanted to make it clear that any cat that's not an unowned, uh, sorry, that's not a domestically owned cat uh, can be managed for wildlife protection. It doesn't just have to be those feral ones in those really, really remote areas. Cool. Um, it, it is quite complicated though, I'm going to say. I'm sure. Hey, um, look, I think we've, um, that you have answered all those questions. Um, we were really looking forward to um, hearing from you, Imogen, because we're um, excited about what this could mean for the Waitakere Rangers and how our groups can um, work better with council to try and um, achieve some of those aspirations. Mm, um, so thank mm. you very much for coming along today. Um, I, does anyone else have any final questions? I can't, I think I've covered them all. Well, um, and while they're pondering, I um, just on that cat issue and, and thinking about me coming along and talking. So we are doing quite a bit of work at the moment on, um, on some responsible pet ownership stuff and some communications to do some really place-based stuff that is really quite exciting and cool. And I think this is such a challenging, thorny issue um, we're seeing bubbling up around the country. And so I'd love to come back maybe at some point in the future and talk more about, uh, about that because um, we're looking at some really nice engagement stuff that will help um, community conservation groups such as yourselves have really constructive conversations with your local cat owners. So if, if you're willing to have me back on that at some point in the future when we've sort of firmed up that content a little bit more, I'd really like to, to do that. We'd really like that, Imogen. Um, we look forward to hearing from uh, more from you um, because, yeah, I think we can work um, well together. Um, mm. So thank you, Imogen. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you all for all your amazing hard work. Oh.